Point of order, Mr. Andrew Slaughter. Uh, thank you. A uh, point of order which I give in notice to you and to the Honourable Member for Brentford and Isleworth. Hammersmith flyover in my constituency has been closed for three weeks, and although we hope for good news as early as today about the reopening, it's clearly a serious matter for my constituents. The Honourable Member for Brentford and Isleworth has convened a public meeting, nothing wrong with that, to discuss the matter, but she's convened the meeting and advertised it in my constituency, inviting various public bodies, but not myself, to be a party to that meeting uh, and, and, uh, and not to be on the panel at that meeting to discuss these matters. Mr Speaker, this goes beyond the ordinary trespassing that, that members sometimes fall into. I've never heard of, of an event of this kind. It means in reality that those public bodies may not attend because it's now a party political meeting. But I would ask for your guidance. Uh, I would ask for your guidance, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Member is a new member. She may not know the protocols of the House as well as others do. Standing thus far, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for advance notice of his intention to raise the point of order. It will almost certainly not be a matter of order for the Chair, but reserving my position, I think it only right, and I'm sure the Honourable Gentleman would accept this, but before I say anything further, I ask the Honourable Lady, the Member for Brentford and Isleworth, to offer her own thoughts, of which I've had some advance notice, but on the floor of the House. The Honourable Lady. Um, This public meeting is a meeting purely to help local residents, and it's for Transport for London and Hounslow and Hammersmith councils to up local residents, to update local residents um, and help them, and that is frankly what I come into politics to do. I am extremely disappointed that the Honourable Member for Hammersmith has attempted to threaten, intimidate and bully me into helping him, into doing what he wants and play political games. Even although he knew what was happening, I told him at the earliest opportunity he was invited to the meeting verbally by me and also in writing. And he said initially he was happy with the plans for the meeting. I have worked well recently with my Labour Hounslow Council. I expect a very positive working relationship with the new member for Feltham and Heston. Um, and it's really sad that we cannot go and help our local residents without an, an honourable member trying to yeah, stop us from yeah, doing so. Yeah, and what yeah. we should be doing is all working together for the good of our local residents and our constituents. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, order. I assume the honourable gentleman's point of order is on an unrelated matter. No, no. no I, order. Just before the honourable gentleman jumps to his feet, let me just say... This. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for advance notice and for his attempted point of order, and I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady for what she has said to me via email and on the floor of the House. I do not myself think it is a matter of order for the Chair. It concerns a matter operational outside of the Chamber of the House. I would want to reiterate the exhortation to members to cooperate on matters affecting neighbouring constituencies and to observe the customary courtesies of informing other members about actions and visits proposed which take place in another member's constituency. These are, however, not rules of the House. They are conventions. I do intend to leave this matter here for today. I say this with no discourtesy to any honourable member, but because there is pressing business of the House to which we need to move. And before we do so, I must of course take what I gather is a totally separate and unrelated point of order from the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Wrexham, Mr Ian Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is indeed completely separate. Uh, Mr Speaker, in the previous debate, the Minister at the Dispatch Box, speaking on behalf of the Government, expressly contradicted the content of the motion before the House in a response and an intervention to me. But the Government did not oppose the motion when it came to a vote. Can you, Mr Speaker, offer me guidance as to ascertaining what the Government's position on this particular matter is? Thankfully, that's not a matter for the Chair. I have no influence over the conduct of the government, the decisions it makes about policy or the way in which it chooses either to vote or not to vote. And in saying that, I think that the Honourable Gentleman will hear my expression of relief. (laughs) Point of order, Mr Chris Bryant. It's following that one, really, because notwithstanding what you just said, Mr Speaker, it is a matter of order 
that it is the custom of the House that a vote follows a voice. And if the voice had spoken in one direction but then had not proceeded to follow it up with a vote, that would surely be disorderly. I think if somebody says one thing and then votes in a different direction, that would be a breach of order. I think if an individual member, be that a backbencher or a minister, gives an indication of a view but chooses not to vote in the division, that is qualitatively in a different category. I have a sense coming on of a potentially stimulating but arcane and preferably delayable exchange on this matter with the Honourable Member for Rhonda. Perhaps we can now move to the second debate, or I apologise to colleagues who are disappointed, or in a moment, but the appetite for questioning the Foreign Secretary and his colleagues is invariably insatiable and unassuaged, as the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Rhonda, helpfully points out from a sedentary position. Point of order, Mr Dennis McShane. Mr Speaker, on Thursday the 12th of January, the Russian Embassy published a highly personal and wholly inaccurate attack on me on their website. It related to a debate the previous day about human rights in Russia and the treatment of Sergei Magnitsky, in which several right honourable and honourable members of all parties spoke. I believe this is the first time that the Foreign Embassy accredited to Her Majesty's Government has so attacked a member for carrying out his parliamentary duties. Clearly the Russian Embassy is not covered by the rules of privilege or free expression in Parliament. Well, I would hope, Mr Speaker, you would not think this was a welcome development and right honourable and honourable members must be able to say what they think and believe about other countries without coming under pressure or intimidation from embassies or accredited diplomats. Yeah. Gentlemen, both for his point of order and for advance notice of it, I can certainly agree with him that no member of the House should be intimidated in exercising his or her undoubted right to free expression in this House. I might add that my own imagination is moderately vivid, but the idea of the Right Honourable Gentleman being intimidated either by the Russian Embassy or by anybody else is quite beyond it. Well, they send you bottles of vodka and take you to Japanese restaurants. If there are no further points of order or sedentary heckles, either from the member for Rhonda or anyone else, we shall now come to the ten-minute rule motion. Point of order, Mr Ian Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, is it in order for the Honourable Member for South West Devon to describe Dudley as ugly? Why should a place which boasts the UK's first national geological nature reserve, a fantastic castle, a beautiful town centre which traces its roots back to medieval Britain, and the award-winning Black Country Living Museum, why should it be sneered at by somebody like him? Should he not come to Dudley and see these gems for himself? Would you, Mr Speaker, like to come to Dudley so that you'll know just how wrong he was? Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, not only for the content of his point of order, but for his courtesy in giving me advance notice of it. I remind the Honourable Gentleman that a wise person said that there is no point in arguing about taste. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and I'm sure that Dudley is beautiful to its own Member of Parliament. That the Honourable Gentleman is a doughty and articulate exponent of that perceived beauty is no surprise to me, as this year marks 30 years since the Honourable Gentleman and I first made each other's acquaintance at the University of Essex. I'm afraid on this matter of the beauty or otherwise of Dudley, I have not myself yet had an opportunity to form my own judgment, but I appreciate the Honourable Gentleman's prospective invitation, and I would, of course, be inclined to accept it. I do not think that expressions of aesthetic opinion fall within the rules of order unless those expressions of opinion concern another <coughs> member of the House. Point of order, Mr. Chukka. Uh, I'll come to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm, I'm saving him up. <laughs> He's too precious. I don't want to waste him too early. Point of order, Mr. Chukka Amuna. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you will be aware that excessive pay and rewards for failure in the city and the boardrooms in the country are a matter of huge public interest. Uh, the Government have let it be known that they're going to announce what they're going to do about this issue 
on Tuesday next week. Our strong view is that the Business Secretary should come and do so in an oral statement to the House. He is giving a speech to the Social Market Foundation at 12.30 on Tuesday before the House sits. I, I was wondering whether Mr Speaker could perhaps advise the House on whether you have been given notice that he intends to come first to give an oral statement on what the Government is to do about this matter on Monday and uh, whether or not, sir, you would expect him to do so. Well, gentlemen, for that point of order, of the content of which I did not have advance notice, I would certainly expect that if a significant policy announcement is to be made, a statement in one form or another, and there are different forms of statement, as the Honourable Gentleman will be aware, would first be made to the House. I hope the Honourable Gentleman will understand if I say that more widely than that I would be reluctant to go. I would want to observe how the Government conducts itself and to judge matters accordingly. But both the Leader of the House and the Deputy Leader are aware of the premium that I attach, not on my account, but on behalf of the House, to the House hearing and preferably on very important matters having the opportunity first to question ministers. I think it is desirable that this House hears first rather than audiences outside. A point of order, Mr Paul Flynn. Uh, one of the areas of parliamentary life, the manners of this chamber that has improved in recent years, is it's now completely unacceptable for one member to criticise another member on the basis of gender, on the basis of race, ethnicity or disability. Uh, the most underrepresented group in this parliament are the septuagenarians. Today we heard what I believe many of us thought was a gratuitous and entirely offensive insult uh, to a greatly respected honourable member made entirely because of his age. Isn't it right that ageist discriminatory remarks should be outlawed in the same as other discriminatory remarks are? I will take the further to that point of order and then I will come back on the matter. Point of order, Mr Brown Donahoe. I thank you, Mr Speaker. Is it not also the case that Erskine May makes it very clear that no member of Parliament should criticise another one and, and call them a name that relates to an animal and differ in these circumstances. Is it not only right that then the Prime Minister should come back to his place and apologise to the member for Bolsover? Is it on the same matter? On the same matter, I must of course listen to a point of order from Mr David Winnick. That, uh, those of us of a certain age group should not be seen as the new persecuted minority. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, is it on the same matter? Gosh, a vintage quartet indeed. Point of order from... <laughs> and a, a very high quality vintage. Point of order, Mr Mark Pritchard. Thank you, Mr Speaker. You've seen the grey hairs as well. I, um, uh, on my head, of course. Um, I, I just wonder, Mr Speaker, uh, I seek your guidance on whether this uh, Parliament would be better and this House of Commons would be better with more or less humour. Well, I'm always in favour of humour, but just as beauty is in the eye of the beholder, humour is a matter of subjective judgment. Sometimes people are funny, sometimes they think they're funny, sometimes they think they're funny deliberately when they're not, sometimes they don't realise they are funny when they are. There are all sorts of different permutations. Now, I think it would be unwise for me to offer a view as to the category into which the matter of current discussion happens to fall. But I've never had any doubt about the Honourable Gentleman's well-developed and furnished sense of humour. Let me come back to the point from the Honourable Gentleman member for Walsall North. I agree that septuagenarians should not become a persecuted minority. The Honourable Gentleman is sometimes in a minority, and a principled minority, on a range of matters and has been throughout his long parliamentary career. All I would say is I don't think the Honourable Gentleman himself is persecuted, certainly not by me, and I think anybody trying to persecute the Honourable Gentleman should frankly give up the unequal struggle, because that person's not going to get anywhere with the Honourable Member for Walsall North. As to the point of order from the Honourable Gentleman from 
central Ayrshire, I think I'm right in saying that Erskine May no longer contains the prohibition to which the Honourable Gentleman refers. And I think that, certainly at one time or another, there has been a prohibition on or presumption against reference to an existing animal. <laughs> as far as the Honourable Gentleman, the member for Newport, is concerned, I think what I would say is that it's very difficult for me to interpret the mindset of another Honourable or Right Honourable member, be that a newly arrived member or a very senior member or the most senior member of the government. Sometimes I think an observation might be made with reference to perhaps a past attitude, style or conduct. And I don't think I want to get into the issue of what was said today. I might want to reflect on it. All I would say is that I share the Honourable Gentleman's absolute disapproval of sexism, rage, racism, ageism and other forms of discrimination. And the Honourable Gentleman's track record on that matter, at any rate, speaks for itself over a very long period. If there are no further points of order, perhaps now we can come to the 10-minute rule motion said, and I remind the House that points of order don't arise on personal statements, but unrelated points of order can indeed be raised. Point of order, Fiona McTaggart. Mr Speaker, I wondered if it was in order for ministers to abuse opposition backbenchers on the basis of their age or gender. <laughs> Yesterday, we heard the Prime Minister do that to the 79-year-old Honourable Member for Bolsover. That problem was repeated today. Order. Mr. Shelbrook, who's now engaging busily in a conversation with the Honourable Gentleman for Harrogate and Ellsworth. Calm yourself. The Honourable Lady is raising a point of order about manners to which I intend to listen and with which I will deal. And it hardly helps if people are sniggering and smirking at the point the Honourable Lady is making. Point of order, Fiona McTaggart. The Honourable Gentleman for South East Cambridgeshire did the same thing today when he described the Honourable Member for Brighton as hysterical. And I wondered, Mr Speaker, you've used the word manners in your intervention. I wonder, Mr Speaker, if there is something you can do to promote better manners in this chamber so that members don't face abuse from government ministers. Yes. The Honourable Lady, is that Erskine May is clear that good temper and moderation in the use of language are the hallmarks of parliamentary debate, and to that I would simply add good taste. And I hope that that is helpful. Point of order, Mr Peter Bone. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week's business questions, I asked about a little boy who was being denied uh, cancer treatment. And thanks to the intervention of the leader and the immediate intervention of the Secretary of State for Health, that treatment was granted. Sometimes the public get the impression that Parliament doesn't work. On that occasion, it clearly did. And I wonder how I could get that on the record, sir. <laughs> The Honourable Gentleman has done so, and he knows it. Point of order, Joan Wally. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that my bill is number 10, Public Body Sustainable Food Bill, on the order paper. And I just wonder, given the difficulties of private members elected to this House being unable to get a sitting day when our valid bills should be debated by the House, whether when you come to our youth parliament in Kidsgrove, you could just explain to young people in my constituency the archaic procedures of this House in getting proper legislation through. I would welcome such a challenge. <laughs> Point of order, Mr Thomas Doherty. Point of order, Mr Speaker. Um, being mindful of, of your advice previously to ministers, um, you will have seen today, I'm sure, that the Deputy Prime Minister's statutory veteran of lobbyists has been leaked to a large number of news outlets rather than being given to the House first. Has the Deputy Prime Minister uh, sought you out to offer a formal apology for this gross discourtesy? 
the Honourable Member for Dunfermline and West Fife for that point of order. The short answer is no. No such conversation has taken place. But what I would say to the Honourable Gentleman, whom I wish well for the weekend, is let's wait and see what Monday brings. Point of order. Order. Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The IMF today revised down its growth forecast for um, 2012 from 1.6 to 0.6 per cent and asked for the government to reconsider the pace of their deficit reduction plans. Has the Speaker had any indication that the Chancellor plans to come to the House to give the government's response? I have received no such indication, but I am sure that the Honourable Lady will pursue these matters through the order paper and in other ways if she's dissatisfied with the position as it stands. Uh, yes, point of order, Mr John Mann. Thank you, M- M- Mr Speaker. In answering a series of questions on the printed in Hansard on the 19th of Jan- January in column 947W, the Treasury Minister, in relation to a series of questions about 18 separate and current EU proposals on financial services, responded that when EU legislation is being reviewed or prepared, responses by the UK authorities to a public consultation will be made available on the Commission website. Mr Speaker, is it sufficient when a member of this House is raising questions of the British Government that a series of questions should be answered by referral to potential uh, statements put up on the European Commission website rather than answering to this Parliament as a Minister is duly responsible to do? Yes. Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his point of order, of which there has been no breach. There's no breach of order in the method that the Minister has chosen to reply to the Honourable Gentleman. But the Honourable Gentleman's point of order will have been heard on the Treasury bench, and I hope that in framing answers to written questions, Ministers will take some account of the convenience of honourable and right honourable members in being able to access information. I recall from my own experience as a backbencher that it was exceptionally irritating when a series of carefully crafted written questions were responded to in what was certainly a desultory and some might have thought a discourteous manner. And to do so to the Honourable Gentleman is certainly a hazardous enterprise because he's bound to raise it on the floor of the House, as he's just eloquently demonstrated. Point of order, order, Mr Gordon Marsden. Uh, Further, the point of order, Mr Speaker, which I've already given you notice of. Um, I put down two name day questions for answer on December 13th by the Department of Communities and Local Government, factual questions about the state of their payment of money for regional projects for the European Regional Development Fund. Uh, Despite polite follow-up questions from my office, no further reply was received until yesterday, and I was very surprised and concerned that the Minister responsible, the Member for Welwyn Hatfield, had inserted into his reply a tendentious and very partial and lengthy attack on the previous Government, including inaccurate comments uh, about myself uh, on this matter. And the phrase is, you know, argument we shout like mad and protesting too much on the Honourable Member's part come to mind, but Mr Speaker, is it not an abuse of conventions and courtesies of the House to pervert a factual written reply in this matter to a member? And given that it's now appeared in Hansard in this form, what what, uh, recourse is there to amending it so that it actually reflects only the factual information I requested from the Minister, more suitable to a Minister of the Crown, rather than a boastful rant, more suited to a timeshare salesman. The gentleman for his point of order and for advance notice of it. As to the question of retrospective amendment, I don't feel comfortable to say anything now. What I would say to the Honourable Gentleman in response to his point of order is twofold. First, the content of ministerial answers is not a matter for the Chair, and the Honourable Gentleman may wish to write to the Procedure Committee if, as is obviously the case, he is dissatisfied. Secondly, however, I will say that, in my view, ministers should avoid putting in their written answers to written parliamentary questions polemical matter which would not be allowed in the questions themselves. The table office regulates 
the manner of the asking of the question, and ministers must exercise some responsibility and demonstrate, if I may say so, some courtesy in the manner of their answers. Point of order, Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. You very generously allowed the questions on the urgent notice question to go on for 49 minutes. And obviously there is enormous interest in the situation in Iran, and the Leader of the House is present. Have you had any intimation, or would you accept any requests for a much fuller debate on the whole situation facing Iran in the very near future? Because quite clearly the whole situation is extremely dangerous. Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, a senior government whip, chuntering, but rather chuntering, rather helpfully from a sedentary position, says that there's a defence debate on Thursday. Well, I'm grateful to him. I don't think he was saying it for my benefit, but I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, right Honourable Gentleman. Nevertheless, that may be a suitable vehicle for the Honourable Member for Islington North to air his concerns. I don't want to be pedantic about it, but when he says, would I accept, he will know, of course, that the scheduling of business is a matter for the usual channels. I think the Treasury bench will have heard his concern, and he will know that I allowed the question to run a substantial time because I felt that it was a matter of the highest importance, on which there could have been, but didn't have to be, a statement by government volunteered, and in which there was evidently very substantial interest. I hope that that will be taken into account, and the government will realise members want to be updated on a regular basis. Order. Point of order, Natasha Engel. Thank you, Mr Speaker. At its meeting yesterday, the Backbench Business Committee decided to amend the business for tomorrow very slightly to include a pre-EU Council topical debate at the beginning of the day. Unfortunately, this has meant that we've had to postpone the presentation of a report by the Chair of the uh, Public Administration Select Committee. Mr Speaker, could you give me some advice? Since the Backbench Business Committee is unable to make an emergency business statement to inform the House of the change of business at such short notice, how do I best go about doing so? As I would have expected, the Honourable Lady has provided her own salvation. The information is on the record and the House is grateful to the Chair of the Backbench Business Committee. Point of order, Caroline Flint. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. This morning... The government lost its appeal against a High Court ruling that the cuts to the solar tariff payments are legally flawed. The government has spent at least £66,000, cost social housing providers maybe at least a million pounds, and created even more uncertainty, putting thousands of jobs at risk. Can you tell me, Mr Speaker, whether you've received any indication at all from ministers at the Department for Energy and Climate Change that they intend to come to this House and make a statement to explain how they plan to clear up the mess they've created? Uh, The short answer is that I have received no such indication or communication from a debt minister, but I just have a sense, I don't know why, perhaps it's my nearly 15 years in the House, the fact that the Honourable Lady and I came into the House together, that she will pursue the matter at debt questions tomorrow, probably like a terrier. And point of order, Mr Bernard Jenkin. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, on a separate point of order, but relating to the role of my right honourable friend, the Leader of the House, <laughs> I am sure that he would want to fulfil his function as leader of the whole House and not just to be a spokesman for the government about government business. Could I ask, uh, Mr Speaker, whether you would have a word with my right honourable friend to explore how a hiatus such as this could be avoided in the future and that the leader of the House could actually carry out his function as leader of the whole House? Well, it's not for the Chair to intervene in this matter and certainly not to pronounce now. What I would say to the Honourable Gentleman is that he's put the ball into play and I rather imagine that it will be returned, probably (laughs) before long. Whether it's returned with interest or topspin or slice, I don't know, but I imagine that the ball will be returned. And secondly, I say to the Honourable Gentleman that I have regular and very constructive and convivial discussions, both with the Leader of the House and with the, no, not with alcohol, uh, both with the Leader of the House and with the Shadow Leader of the House, and I intend that those discussions will continue. I bear in mind the point that the Honourable Gentleman has made. Point of order, Mr John Woodcock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
Is it in order for the House to read the detailed contents of an important statement on charging heavy goods vehicles, including a, di a direct quotation from the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State in selected newspapers before the statement is laid? Do you think, Mr. Speaker, that this, may, this tactic may have something to do with the fact that the statement itself shows that the government is actually breaking the coalition agreement by proposing to increase charges on more than 28,000 British lorry drivers, a fact which was strangely absent from the briefing to the newspapers. What can be done about this, Mr Speaker? Has. It is, of course, perfectly in order for a written ministerial statement to be laid, and I gather that such a statement has been laid today, that is of itself a legitimate vehicle for informing the House about ministerial decisions and other matters. However, and this is a very important caveat, the contents of such statements should not be released. I emphasise should not be released under any circumstances that I can imagine to the media before being made available to members of the House. And I would just underline the very basic doctrine of ministerial responsibility to Parliament, because I know it is sometimes said in circumstances of this kind by a minister that the minister didn't do any such thing. Ministers, I know, will accept that they are responsible for everything that is done in their departments, by officials, by special advisers. That's the situation, and this should not happen. Uh, point of order, Anne Main. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I, I seek your guidance. Is it appropriate parliamentary language for a member of Parliament to cover, call other honourable members Neanderthals, particularly when they haven't even been anywhere near the debate or participated in or engaged in it? Do you think it's a somewhat judgmental statement, Mr Speaker? Well, I think if we're going to have a prohibition on judgmentalism, uh, we're setting ourselves rather an exacting test. What I would say to the honourable lady is twofold. First of all, I'm not aware, though it's not relevant to the appropriateness of her point of order, who the target, though I can try to speculate about it, of this intended abuse was. But secondly, if the target of the intended abuse is at least one member that I can think of, I rather imagine that far from complaining about it, he will take it as the greatest possible compliment that has ever been paid <laughs> to him. Uh, point of order, I, I choose randomly for a point of order, Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg. Point of order, M Mr Speaker, I think many honourable members would consider being called ne ne Neanderthals remarkably modern. <laughs> <laughs> I note the honourable gentleman's value judgment and indeed his sense of humour. If there are no further points of order, I've got a suspicion that there are points of order. Thank you, Prime Minister. A point of order, Mr Chris Bryant. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. The, you will know that the Ministerial Code of Conduct makes it clear that ministers have to provide timely answers to questions, written questions tabled by members of the House and that this is underlined in a motion um, of the House. Uh, now, I, in uh, December of last year, tabled three questions to the Secretary of State for the Home Department uh, for answer, name day answer on the 14th of December and then another two on the 20th of December for answer on the 10th of January. I still had no reply, so last week I decided that I'd table a question asking when I was going to get an answer to these questions and I was very excited yesterday to get a reply which said I will reply as soon as possible. <laughs> now, is there surely what the Ministerial Code means is that we must get substantive replies and not evasive replies of this which make it look as if the question has been answered but it hasn't actually been answered. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his point of order, and I would say two things in response to him. First, of course, he's right on the substantive point that the reply that is forthcoming should not only be timely, but substantive. It's not good enough for ministers to provide holding replies, particularly when they're holding replies provided very late, simply saying, I'll reply as soon as possible. It must be a substantive reply. Secondly, moderately vivid imagination though I possess, a fact to which I made reference in responding to someone last week, I really cannot imagine a colleague whom it is more impolitic or foolish to fail timiously to answer than the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Rhonda, for there is no colleague more absolutely certain 
to make a very substantial and justified fuss about it for some considerable period after the non-event. <laughs> the honourable gentleman should take his compliments when they come to him. It was. Points of order, Mr Crispin Blunt. Minister Blunt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the course of oral questions uh, to the Ministry of Justice uh, earlier this afternoon, there were a number of questions about the deaths of Alex Kelly and Jake Hardy uh, in youth custody. And in the course of those replies, I said there hadn't been a death in custody uh, of such kind since 2007. Of course, that overlooked the case of Ryan Clark, who died uh, in April uh, 2011, for whom an inquest verdict is still awa awaited. And I would like to make sure, take this out as opportunity to correct the record. I'm most grateful to the Minister for doing so, and for doing so as promptly as he's done. It will be noted and appreciated by the House. If there are no further points of order, we come now to...